Have you thought about the Roman Empire today? Unless you're in the Percy Jackson fandom or in the classics, I'm just going to assume that you haven't. My Latin teacher would be so ashamed of you. But you've probably thought about the Latin word panem, which means bread, and it's also the name for the dystopian United States setting in the Hunger Games. And if the marketing team for the movie is doing their job, you've probably thought about Mockingjay Part 2 because it's coming out on November 20th. This is the final installment of the Hunger Games movies, and I don't know about y'all, but I'm excited. I enjoyed the books, I've enjoyed the movies, and I think overall it's an awesome series. Suzanne Collins is great at weaving in complex societal issues into the Hunger Games without making her books feel preachy. Except for the message that killing children is wrong. She's super preachy about that. And for the most part, the movies have done a great job of capturing those elements. So there are two changes to the movies that I'm never really gonna be okay with. While I'm not arguing that Jennifer Lawrence is an extremely talented actress who has done a stellar job of portraying Katniss Everdeen for the complex character that she is, it still ticked me off that race played a big enough role in the socio-political environment of District 12 that Suzanne Collins made a point of mentioning it several times throughout the first book, and this directly impacts Katniss as a woman of color, and it was just completely ignored in the movies. Like, representation for women of color is scary enough in young adult literature, not to mention mainstream films. And then they got a white girl to play her! Why, Diggle, why? Why did they whitewash characters? And the second thing, which is the subject of this video, regards the character Finnick O'Dare, the princess's favorite character, as evidenced by this cup. Though most people see it as the worst book, I didn't actually think Mockingjay was a bad book. One of the things I liked about it was seeing Katniss and Finnick bond. And we see a lot more of who Finnick truly is when his flirtatious mask falls away. Finnick, like everybody else in the freaking series, is vulnerable. His demeanor is an act to distance himself from the horrors that he's faced. He is not as aloof and careless as his sexually charged nature leads us to believe. In District 13, with no one from the Capitol watching him, that Finnick is gone. He's consumed with worry about Annie's safety, he's scared for his life, he's frail and nervous, and oftentimes he's very distant. These are all things we've never seen in Finnick's character before, and I knew that Sam Claflin was gonna do a good job. I was especially looking forward to one scene in particular. I want to follow that by saying I don't enjoy this scene, it's not something that makes me happy, but I think it's really important. In Chapter 12 of Mockingjay, District 13 sends out a rescue team to the Capitol to rescue Vita, Annie, and Joanna. As a diversion, they run a broadcast of Katniss and Finnick being interviewed so that the Capitol will be so busy trying to stop the broadcast that they won't notice the rescue team. Finnick's opening line is that President Snow used to sell him. Sell, like, in the human trafficking sense. He talks about how if people want a victor and they can pay enough, President Snow arranges that. And should a victor refuse, he kills a loved one. Because he's a dick. After he's done talking, Katniss has this moment where she realizes that had it not been for her romance with Peeta in the games, she probably would have ended up in the same place as Finnick. She and Hamish have a short exchange where Hamish says that he was never forced into prostitution because Snow had killed everybody in his family, so he had no leverage over him. But he tells her that he was the example. The person to hold up to to the young Phoenix, Joannas, and Cashmere's of what could happen to a victor who caused problems. The scene is only three pages long, and it's not super rough to read because Phoenix's confession is only a page. And there's nothing particularly intense or graphic about the language, which is something I like about it. It's not sensationalized. And this scene sheds a whole different light on so many of the things that we know about Phoenix's character. Going back and reading his introduction and catching fire is kind of disturbing. Kenna sees him as a player who sleeps with anybody who wants to just because he's pretty. At 14, he's one of the youngest people to ever win the Hunger Games, and one of the reasons he won was because of his good looks. People thought he was pretty, so they bought him things. Including his signature weapon, a trident, which Katniss says is the most expensive gift she's ever seen given during the games. She also remarks on his costume for the chariot parade thing, which is a fishing net strategically placed over his junk so that he's not technically naked, but he's basically naked. So like, sexual slavery, but also super sexual whenever he's in the public eye. Finnick's success in the games is a really sick harbinger for what the next 10 years of his life is going to be like. Because he's beautiful, people are willing to pay to be with him, and they buy him expensive gifts to make themselves feel like they're not actually forcing a child into a sexual relationship. 
Now, why is this scene important? Some of the small amount of books that are about sexual abuse, an even smaller portion is about male sexual abuse. Male sexual abuse is hardly discussed at all, like ever. Probably because of the super gross idea we have in our society that men can't be raped because all men want sex all the time, no matter how young they are, no matter the circumstances. And Finnick's abuse never intersects with this idea. None of the male characters approach Finnick like, hey, You've been getting raped consistently since you were 14, because otherwise your family might die. That's a great deal. No, because it's not. The story we get a lot more often is that of Joanna, the cool and cold-blooded killer who is emotionally detached because of the sexual abuse. This kind of story is bordering on the misogynistic idea that is disguised as empowerment that women who are sexually abused are the stronger for it. But no, Collins doesn't go that route. She focuses on Finnick. And since it was adapted into a movie, it could have opened up this really important conversation about male sexual abuse. Which is why I was just like, yes, the movies have done a great job of showing how messed up Pen Am is. I have so much faith that they will not disappoint me. So much faith. President Snow used to sell me, or my body at least. Wait, that was it? No, but really, it's already over? What? For those of you who saw the movie, you might not remember this scene because it's over in like three seconds. Like I was listening for it and I almost missed it. So why was this really heavy in the book, but so forgettable in the movie? Well, in the book, the only thing for the reader to focus on is the interviews and what Katniss and Finnick do to occupy themselves while they wait for the rescue team to get back. The movie actually shows the rescue. So we have Finnick telling us about Prezi Snow's rise to power, and we also have these super tense action sequences. This is basically what it was like for the last 20 minutes of the movie. Oh my gosh, everything could go so badly. This is masterful tension right here. Oh my god, I care about these characters so much. I think showing the rescue was a good choice cinematically because it was not only really well done, but it added a lot of punch to an otherwise dry area of the book. It removed the several hours where Katniss and Finnick are sitting around doing nothing. I think somebody sleeps at some point, but the way Finnick's confession is kind of just thrown into the movie feels really cheap. One of the reasons it's so easy to miss is that when he says this first line, the camera's not even on him. For some reason, we're looking at President Coyne and BT. Like, that was Finnick's moment, and they just messed it up! Finnick's situation is unfortunately not an uncommon one, with one in six men experiencing some sort of sexual abuse before they're an adult. And yet, male sexual abuse is usually ignored when conversations about rape culture are had, which is why it's important to talk about the rare instances when those stories are told. Part of me wonders if this will be addressed any further in Mockingjay Part 2, but Considering how little of Finnick's character we actually saw in Mockingjay Part 1, I don't really have high hopes for that. The princess is just kind of hoping that they'll forget that he dies. What makes things worse is they haven't even made a Finnick pop doll for me to, like, keep alive in my memory. Just, like, fuck those lizard things, I swear to god. Thanks for watching. Give this video a thumbs up if you're excited for the new movie. Let me know in the comments who your favorite character is, or something in the books that you really wished had made it into the movies. And subscribe for videos every Wednesday. The princess will see you next week. Kids, get off my porch! It is dark out, go home. Why do they gotta play outside of our porch? Like, why, why us? Why can't they go to the abandoned apartments? I'm not abandoned, I'm being refurbished.